Hey, another ZDTV, Ken. How are oh, you, buddy? Hello. I am doing pretty well, Clint. Thanks for well, having me. Oh, always there. You are a necessity. You know, we this is a tag team duo, right? Or dynamic duo. It's been I a while for you. Good. It's been yep. a while. You weren't here last week. You weren't here the week before, right? Off doing stuff. Off doing stuff. It's, it's amazing. People, the, the world was clamoring for Ken. So uh, here we are back again. Uh, Going to do another ZDTV. Um, What's uh, what's on your mind this week? Anything interesting? Oh well, um, been trying to lay out a nice welcome mat for people in the doc site and bring my best there to just sort of uh, imagine myself as a new reader and try to understand everything that's already been written, which is quite a bit. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Yep, and always need more. <laughs> All right, so let's look at the agenda. What is our agenda? We're going to look at the 0.21.11 release. It's been a while since I've read some release notes. So uh, we're going to read some release notes. Then we're going to get our special guest star, Eugene, in here. Maybe we can bring him in. Actually, you know, let's just bring him on in. What do you think, Ken? Yeah. Should we bring him in early? Let's bring Absolutely. him in. There's Eugene. Hey, Eugene. Welcome back. Uh, hello, everyone. All right. So we're going to talk about the latest in Zedifications that Eugene's been working on around beats and whatever is beats and why people use it and that sort of stuff. And then we'll talk about these service edge router policies or SERPs and why that's kind of interesting from this week. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so let's get into reading. Uh Oh, why am I hearing myself? Ken, I got a, I must have, I hang on one second. I must have like a, uh, ZDTV somewhere. That's why I got a tab open. That oh, was yeah. very, very confusing. Uh, there was a few well, you know, you, you know, I don't know if you're like me, but I opened about eight thousand tabs, and one of those tabs happened to be YouTube. So that was my mistake. All right, let's get into it then. I was, I was looking for the change log. Is why I was going to my browser and it decided to open up on me. What? Let's new? go this way. What's new in twenty six dot eleven? It's mainly a bug fix release. Added some bug fixes we're going to see below. Added some CLI flags for setting the router tunneler capability. Uh, so that's cool. So we, when writing the quick starts, we oftentimes use the ZDCLI to create these configs. And you can use the ZDCLI to create a config for your router. And so now when you make a uh, router config for the edge that is edge enabled, you can decide whether or not you want it to be in tunneler mode. Uh, the tunneler mode by default, I think, is host. And then you can change it to the other modes, which are T proxy or none. You can see that right. down here. Yeah, you have so to that's... do it up front. It can't can't change it later. There's no that's right. It's a it's a one and done. You set it once and you're you're out of there, unless you want to go back and edit the configs. But um, it is important to register your tunneler with the minus t flag when you when you create the tunneler you are sorry the router when you create the router you need to specify that you want it to be tunneler enabled then you can always go back and generate these configs if you wanted to but you do have to tell it to do tunneler when you enroll it or create it uh, so that's fun so if you want to change your configs you can do that that's nice um, it's a change for um the quick start stuff and a whole bunch of Updates and bug fixes. CD Edge lists the Edge router to be offline after recovering from an internet fluctuation. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I don't like it when my internet fluctuates. Enrollment has no verbose option for debugging. Oh yeah, that was a fun one. I added. I actually did that one. That's exciting. I added the flag so now you can get some debug information when you're doing enrollment. Um, incorrect documentation for gRPC sample, no doc for call example, check client and server needs doc. And then oh, down in ZD, edge outer override and router name, go back to making those quick starts. Well, that's a fun and exciting bug release. So that's that. Um, next up on our agenda, if I can find, where's the agenda? Show me the agenda again. Boom. All right. Now we're going to be looking at uh, Eugene's screen. And talking about beats. So, Eugene, can you uh, pop up your share and we can start talking some beats? What even is beats? Um, so, you want me to share on Zoom, of course? I do. 
Yeah, so it looks legible. Actually, I, see, um, I think it's already shared. No, well, I see. I see the Zoom meeting. Yeah, let me just switch to the right thing. I've just been waiting, so I don't uh, go into the. Uh, where was I? Okay, so let's start with there this. There we go. There we go. Uh oh, get it. Go away. Go away. How do I get those things to go away? They're supposed to just go away. Uh, okay, so, so, so this is what I've kind of been working on. Um, if you think about, let's talk about monitoring in general first. Uh, you know, before we jump into beats. Um, so monitoring is really important, right? You have your production system, whatever it is. Could be distributed IoT solution, could be distributed database, could be a number of things. Um, and you want to know how healthy your system is, right? So you would deploy your monitoring solution alongside it, right? To, to make sure that everything is up to snuff, um, that the hardware is behaving the way it is, the hardware is not overloaded. Uh, you want to monitor for any, any kind of um, attacks, uh, security attacks on your infrastructure. Uh, so it's all all well and done, right? The monitoring is kind of orthogonal to your, to your business. But on the other hand, your monitoring solution is another distributed system that you also run. So you want to make sure that your monitoring system is also as secure as possible, right? So if an uh, attacker could attack your monitoring first and then do some bad to your real system, then you're in trouble because then you know you don't get alerts, you don't get any kind of notification that uh, that happened. So that's why I see uh, putting zero trust in monitoring solutions. Uh, we think is very important. And uh, here in, at NetFoundry, right, we all work at NetFoundry. We use monitoring solution to monitor our you know, clients' networks, right, to detect any kind of uh, outages or any kind of bad behavior in those networks uh, and to make sure that our monitoring solutions itself is secure, actually striving towards zero trust our operations as well. And we've seen that before with um, using, you know, ZD Bastions or NZSSH. Uh, you know, we had some blog articles from our DevOps team uh, using those kind of tools. So this is kind of falls into the same category where we dot footing our own stuff and using our solutions for um, our, our own zero trust solutions inside the company. So if I understand properly, you're saying that Beats is a solution for those kinds of issues? Yeah. So and we use it. So if you look at this diagram, right, uh, typically you would have your agent deployed, uh, all agents deploy throughout your infrastructure, right? And they submit or ship data to a collector, right? What we use internally is, you know, the Beats collection of tools. So Beats is not a one tool, it's a set of tools. It's probably more than a handful. Collection uh, of uh, agents. Yeah. Uh, so there's a file beat that allows you to ship logs. There is metric beat that allows you to collect any kind of metric information from, from your machine. Um, there is a packet beat to monitor your network traffic. But all they do, they kind of have the same architecture where they collect data locally, and then they ship it up to a collector. Uh, what we use internally for collection is Logstash. And Logstash is the kind of container for, um, for inputs and outputs. It has a, a little bit of um, a flow engine where it takes data from inputs, you know, maybe massages it a little bit and sends it to the output. So internally, we use Logstash with the Beats plugin, input plugin to collect the data. So that was kind of natural to take this path and say, what would it take to make it zero trust? You with me so far? I'm with yeah. you so far. So yeah. uh, you said Beats has a lot of different agents. Did you end up adding ZD to all of those agents or to just one of them? Oh, well, let me get to that. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so it's uh, it's actually is kind of neat that I was able to modify one underlying library and um, they all live in the same project. So basically 
because that project uses that library, all the tools that go through that connection path will be get certified. Yeah, that's what I was hoping. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's that's kind of neat. Um, so, so normally when we deploy, you know, our agents and our logstash, the endpoint that uh, the logstash is opens for the piece to connect to is open on the internet, right? And there's some ways to secure it, right? You can put TLS in it or maybe mutual TLS. Uh, but the endpoint is still on the public internet, right? So it's still vulnerable for DDoS attacks and attacks some like log for shell, right? Logstash is written in Java, so I'm I kind of I think it maybe was um vulnerable to lock for shell stuff, but I'm not sure. I'm not gonna uh, bad mouth anything, but <laughs> you never it know. Be, it could have been you, right? you, you never know, right? There could be yeah. because it's or other internet, there could be other attacks that are just not known yet, right? That's not right hadn't been discovered yet. Yep. Um so we really want to kind of identify both sides. Um so let me start with the agent. Uh, so, agent, so hang, hang on one second, because um, I wasn't aware, but you said that we're actually adding ZD to both sides. Did you actually Zedify both sides? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I did not know if it was going to be application access on one side and a true Zedification and then host access, meaning a tunneler. But that's cool. So we have oh, that, a, this is a true application embedded full Zero trust solution. It's the end to end application embedded solution. That's awesome. Yes. Cool. Okay. Um, so, which side do you want to start first? I can, well, it's I can your think. show. You you drive it. All right. Um, it sounds like each of the agents is tooled to collect a certain type of data, but then convert it into, ship it as a standard API request to Logstash. Um, I, think, I think that's correct. I think that's what you what you would see if uh, you will look at that payload. It looks very similar where they run file uh, file beat or metric beat. It basically wraps the uh, whatever's inside with some metadata, and metadata is right. Uh, so the log stash doesn't need to know that it's expecting p caps or log lines. It it just it's just data. And we stash. use both metric beats and uh, file beats. Yes, you know? as, as far as I know. We definitely use file beats. Uh, we yeah. probably use metric beats for like normal hardware monitoring stuff. Cool. All right, so uh, you should be seeing my ID here. Yep. Um, it's all actually is published. So let me just go to the room. I need to find the right tab here. Well, I'm glad to see that I'm not the only one who has a thousand tabs open. That's Fantastic. Thank you for uh, making me feel better, Eugene. Right. So um, we can actually start right here. The me my ID. Right. So we forked, you know, Elastic Beats into our OpenZ test kitchen, right? It's just a fork. And uh, there is a ZT5 branch uh, sitting in it. It has a kind of instructions of what to do here. Uh, but generally, you know, if you follow kind of this, uh, eventually, I'll show you how to, to write on this command if we have time for the demo. Um, so as far as code is concerned, right, I have this branch. And I can basically show um, whatever my commits are right in here. So yeah, I was, I was I was interested to see what you needed to change in order to accomplish this. Right. So first of all is a readme. I added the readme to for ZD. Obviously, right? That's that's okay. Um, the other part is basically just goes into Go mod, and you will see that there's a lot of updates just because we're pulling our SDK. There are some updates to libraries that get used. Uh, but the real meat and potatoes here is it's going to be, let's just versions, versions, versions. Uh, you can see that our um, dependencies get pulled in, right? All our OpenZ library. Mm -hmm. But the real meat of potatoes is actually here, right? Where we say, um, 
take this, whatever you want to use Elastic Agent Leaps, use Alf work of it, right? Interesting. And that's it, right? There is no more changes, right? So all the changes that are in the actual code itself are going to be living in here, right? Okay. So, and this is, this is beats itself and, and does, does beats, this one beats, com, uh, does it contain all of the other kinds, the metrics, the packet, the, no, this is the, just a like a parent project, right? And you will see there is a audit beat, file beat, heartbeat. So if you go to the file, file beat, it's and they have, that'll have a reference to that's, yeah. that's, that's the, basically the, that's the main program here. Yeah. So if you're using Beats, are you ultimately definitely shipping to Elasticsearch? No, there are other outputs, but I've only tested with no. Um, we're shipping to Logstash through Logstash. I think you can ship to other places, but I only have I only tested with Logstash. Does that makes sense. I guess I'm wondering if Logstash is specific to Elasticsearch. No, Logstash is uh, kind of usually used as intermediary between your agents and Elastic. At least that's how we use it. Uh, but there are probably like a million different configurations you could run them. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, all, all sides are basically very flexible. You know, the beats will have plugins with different uh, upstream protocols, and Logstash has, uh, you know, tons of plugins of both input and output. All right, um, so so this is just beats changes, right? So let's go back. Uh, and so just so I know, yeah, this is, oh, it's interesting because how are you comparing the two? You have a pull request out there? Is that what's going on? No, I just compare against main. Oh, it's interesting. I, I was just noticing the actual URL that's that's shown there. And I was yeah. confused because it didn't have open ZD test kitchen, but I see it on the right hand side there now. Yeah. I see. Okay. This is what you would use like to create a pull request, right? Yep. This is kind of preview of the pull request. Yep. But um, you don't need to, right? So um, so I showed the changes that really all live in that other library that we use, right? So let me go to the last. Like test kitchen libs. Oh, so this should be libs here. Yeah, plastic kitchen libs, right? So this is the fork of the elastic agent libs, right? The the, the one that provides, you know, the uh, the transfer connection, right? And this is where we have a fork here. Yeah. So we have a branch here that says UI transport. Right. And again, um, so here we actually do have some changes that are code related. So again, those are just updates because we're pulling our SDK and it requires some new version of stuff. So it just uh, updates those. And then at some point we, the, the main one here is pulling SDK Golang. Mm -hmm. project right so this is the dependency side because i was done and then the transport <laughs> that's the, that's the whole thing and then the transport is instead of the net dialer we're creating a zd dialer that falls back to the net dialer so what does that do right so the dialer is a uh, is basically an interface saying open me a connection with this address. So what the ZD dialer does, it, it looks at that connection address and says, is this a ZD intercepted address? And if it is, then we're going to go over ZD overlay network uh, to the service that is that's configured with that intercept address. So that would that use the uh, intercept V1 config in the same way as a tunneler? Yep. Yeah, we'd use uh, all of our existing configurations. So if you, 
let's say deployed beats with a toddler first, right? Using some address. And then you can decide to ditch the toddler and drop in the ZDFI beats binary. You don't need to change anything. Like on the figure side, it's just going to work. Right. Well, the, the only thing that you you probably there's magic here where it comes to finding the identities, right? Yeah, yeah. There's some magic. There's some convention <clears throat> that uh, you need to do. So there's that. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's too much code for me. I need a little bit of uh, time to uh, read the rest of it. <laughs> it is impressively concise. Uh, it, is, it is shockingly concise. That's for sure. It's like uh, Golang's a... uh, Golang's interface or abstraction around connections is fantastic elegant yeah. <laughs> it really is this every is other really language said, uh, needs to take take a, a line from golang on this we've been yep. saying that intercept v1 and host v1 are really tunneler configs but that's not really true anymore since some of the edge sdks have methods like this where you can use an address yeah basically we uh, we started using that inside csdk which means that you know python sdk uses, uses the same concepts that's why uh when we went from the uh was it inter uh what do we call it the ZD, uh, zd tunneler client v1 we we went to the intercept ditching the word tunneler just because it's so common in all the all the implementations to say uh i used to dial this by network address but i want to go to the service to ZD service, you know, how do you do the translation? And right. it's, it's very common in all of these cases. So that's, um, so that's the beat side, right? Uh, so this is the, this, this box over here, right? Uh, so it's going to connect over OPC overlay. So what next I'm going to show you is, that's not the right project. Uh, so there's kind of uh, kind of wet paint still in it, but it's it's running, right? So, so now we're looking at Java, right? Uh, so 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 this is the uh, as, as you can infer from the name, this is log stash input B. So it's a log stash is really just a container and orchestrator of the plugins and. What it tells you it's a, it's the input plugin that implements beat beat protocol beats protocol. You with me so far, right? Yeah. And uh, the lock stash itself is is in Java, but it's using JRuby to do a lot of things. So you can write your plugins using JRuby, uh, and you can you know mix in some Java code as well as well with it. All right. So that's what beats plugin is. Interesting. Um, so again, we forked this log stash into beats and basically zidified it, right? And there's a little bit more code here, right? Um, uh, let me show, show you. Is that because it's a server? It's because it's a server it's, and because it doesn't have... Um, and it might like first foray into you know JRuby and other stuff. This probably could be uh, made a little uh, concise, but uh, so let, let's start with uh, uh, build stuff, right? So we uh, we adding we're basically adding the uh, ZD native library. Uh, why we do that? Because uh, Beats plugin is using Netty under the hood to open the to open the server socket, so we have an implementation that zidifies Netty server sockets. Right? It's that's already provide, provide, provided by the by this library. And so that's uh, basically the main thing. Um, the second thing is the Beats plugin. That was me. All right. So, so this was a copy of the Beats plugin. As I said, it could be probably more concise using um, using Ruby uh, inheritance 
but I just didn't have um, didn't have time to do this. Yeah, but uh, the important part here is you didn't write all this code. You just copied I didn't the rest write. of it. Yeah. So yeah. the real change is over here, right? Um, you see, it was opening the server using Logstash Beat Server. And I mm -hmm. created a class that is Logstash, OpenZD Logstash Beat Server, right? And it has some new parameters. So this is the parameters that will come from the configuration. Do I assume that you just copied server? as well yeah yeah uh, so in here like uh, in this diff stuff you see the regional server so, so actually can we go back to that real quick because this is this is what I was talking about before with respect to the abstraction for the connection APIs like if you look at the way that the old server worked it says you need to provide the host and the port which don't make sense in an overlay world as opposed to what you would do in a Golang world, which is you can provide a transport and then the transport is wrapped into the client for you. You know, it's, it is so, so much nicer to have an abstraction that just is a here, you, you give me the bytes and I'll give you bytes back kind of an approach as opposed to having to do this sort of thing. Uh, C sharp works similar to this as well, where most of the libraries are going to want to actually open that port well, for that, you. That is, uh, that's true to some extent on the client side, but this is at the server side, right? The server side is a little bit different. Even, sure. even the Golang, uh, I don't know it's, if there's a, if there is a mirror of the dialer, th right? That, there is, that they, right? Yeah. There's an acceptor or whatever. It's, it, it is a, it is very easy to make a right. server side go like right, service right. as well um, all for the but, same reasons but but even even here that this is this is not hard right even though we create a new whole new class the actual changes in the class uh you know very minimal yeah it's not hard at all you you just had yeah. to do it on right. in golang you didn't have to you wouldn't have to do that sort of thing right so i can challenge so this is the here, let me do this um so this is the the server listen command, right? That's that's what actually doing the accept loop. Uh, and let's me just do. Right. All right, and this is the corresponding listen of the original. I know it's probably hard to see, but no, it's not. It's all right. All right. So all the stuff is the same, right? All we changed is instead of NIO event loop group, we use default event group, right? Why is that? What is the, uh, just from my own education, what is the difference there? So NIO event loop group uses uh, the Java NIO library to create like NIO sockets. Yep. So, so it has a very specific implementation, right? Uh, because we, in the overlay land, uh, we don't really need the concrete you know, other skipper sockets that an IO event loop group would operate on, right? But again, like in here, um, we creating bootstrap, creating work group, instead of the providing this concrete socket channel class, we giving the ZD server channel factory with the, con with the ZD context and the rest of the same, right? Um, Instead of binding to the host and port, we bind to a service, right? Yep. And that's it. So this is, again, this is probably as easy as it could have, could have been done. And maybe, maybe, maybe we could do it easier, but it's still <laughs> I mean, not a hard, yeah. it's not a hard, it's not a hard lift to, to address. And now does the, does the open ZD one, does it extend the uh, Beats version, or is it its own its own whole copy? Like, is there any way to actually extend the server, or is it you know final? I think we did right. We we extend this. Ah, uh, okay, cool. And just, and, and just override the, the listen. Yep, yep. That's why nice. we did. Uh, uh, I did have a little bit of manipulation here to make sure that I don't create my own initializer stuff. That's why I could use 
uh, once the channel is completed, we can configure the channel handler to do beats right over here. Cool. That makes sense. Um, but anyway, so this is the code. Uh, so I have this, this class uh, in the project. I can just create uh, a library, which is uh, in Ruby terms, it's a gem, gem package. Right, so so this is um, this is the spec that builds the gem, and this is the gem that you basically install into your uh, log stash. Right. So log stash itself is running Ruby or running Java? Well, it's it's, it's running JRuby, right? So running, it has okay. it has a JVM and it runs JRuby that loads. That seems very interesting. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder how I wonder how that got there. Like I wonder how so it, you you have to define the classes in Java, but then you can call them in the JRuby. Yeah. So uh, typically the gems will include all the jars that are needed, right? Um, so gem is just like a zip file and like zip files and set zip files, but um, you can you can we you can look it up, but um, basically it builds this. Part of the build is creating this vendor directory, and you can see that all of the uh, all of the dependent. So it's a fat is. jar that ends up getting bootstrapped by some other class loader. Yeah, yeah, something like that, right? So this is this is our ZD jar, and there is the Unity jar over here, and it's now all it, bootstrapped by JRuby. So now, am I understanding this correctly? That uh, you don't need to rebuild your log stash server. You can just include this gem or yeah, that's exactly package. right. Right. So in here, oh. right on top, it's the I'm sitting in my file beats. In here, I'm sitting in uh, my log stash. All right. So if I go look at the history, right, I'm running log stash. Um, you see this command? Yep. They actually have a uh, install command when you install yep. plugin, and you see that the file from my work area is getting installed, right? That's what I did. Cool. So it's already installed. We don't need to do it again, but, and, and it should basically just installs correctly. Yeah. So, um, so let's give it a good world. Is it ready? All right, so, so now you're going to just start regular log stash that you've already installed oh, that gem okay, into. So, yeah. so one thing I want to show is how you configure it, right? So you see that configuration is is, is from this file, mm -hmm. right? So if you can do it, yeah. cat ls. So what happens here, right? So only so it configures the input, right? So ZD Beats is the input plugin that we use. Uh, remember those ZD identity and ZD service, the two new parameters to the in the in the Ruby file mm. that we had. So, so my... some sort of dependency injection going on there. Uh, or yeah. parameter resolution from some yeah. So like log stash will read this config and say, "Do I have a mapping for ZD Beats? What's what's plugin implements ZD Beats?" I see. And then they're going to look at that plugin. It's going to look at the gem spec. It's going to oh, that's very handy. Load, load that class and say, "I'm going to inject this uh, members into that class." Yeah. Nice. Right. So the port is not really needed. Uh, you can scrap, but what really is important is we're going to host this. Why, service. why is the port there then? Uh, Does it? Is there some? Is there some well. validation that's going on? Uh, it possibly, maybe maybe it's needed uh, to. Keep well, the, this is uh, this is one of those things that a lot of libraries will do. You know, when yeah. you when you try to work around the underlay, like we're doing yeah. here, there's validation somewhere that says, "Hey, you've got to provide me a port. I can't start this right. until you provide me a port." And I'm like, "I don't have to provide you a port. I don't have a port." Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know, port is not even used, right? We can change the. Well, that was I was going to ask the question yeah. if you could make it zero or negative one. It probably validates those as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, cool. But you know the important part is the highlighted part. Um, so let's give it a whirl.
as you can see, even Logstash is a JRuby. It's using the SDK that comes with it for the install. And this install basically just came from um, the Elastic, you know, website, like a downloadable bundle for Logstash. It really does have everything inside that gem, doesn't it? Yeah. So you see, it's starting. Uh, starting something, something. And now you can see that we actually do have some CD stuff coming through. <laughs> Is port fifty forty four actually open? I want to well, know. Yeah. It's... <laughs> Well, we can actually see that if it's something is running on port 5044, which we will find out yeah. that it's actually it's not. Perfect. So uh, we we have now fooled it. That, um, that's that or it even LSO you know, a message saying SS. LNTP. It even logs a message saying that it's binding to that port. Yeah, that's why that's why I mentioned it because it caught I it caught my attention. Yeah, it's probably just a leftover from a uh, base class, right? I'm I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. That's a but, good. But I I just like it because it's a good example of the kinds of uh, little little weird bumps that you run against in other yeah. languages that you don't usually see because of Golang's right. abstraction. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So it's running. It you saw that it's it's is where is the uh except uh so that's a log message from our sdk yeah. so this is a log message from the our server right it's setting starting server for for this service this is uh oh, yeah this is over here right yep and this message i can close this right starting server for the service that's this message that we we see does your uh readme an example have how to set up the actual overlay in it uh, like how did no, you make the service and all that sort of stuff? I, we, we, I can show it in a, in a minute. No, no, no. I just want to make sure that it's there for people who want to try it out. Right. Um, I, I think it's in uh, Beats overlay, like uh, showing how to do it. But like, it's not. I don't really have end to end write write up yet. Oh yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, so this is running. You see, it's uh, kind of accepting connections, even though there's no open port. Right. It's sitting on the. On our overlay, and very cool. Waiting for incoming connections. Yep. So on even on here, we can um, look at the. Uh, so let's see how configured Logstash. So we configure this output log stash. So remember, you know, Beats collects data and it uses the outputs to send it. And it sends it to the service, right? This is service, this is the service how I configure the overlay. Mm -hmm. Right. So test.service.ek is an intercept to find on some service somewhere. Yep. Yeah, it's in my test network. Is it necessarily right? an address or can it also be a service name? It has to be an address because name. because remember we kind of inject at a very low level, right? Using so, the intercept mode requires the the address. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we could probably try to to see if it works that like the other way and like have the dialer recognize it something different. But you know, intercept is so common that um, I just decided to leave it in. Yeah, so right now, right now, if to use these, you need an intercept. That's all. Yeah, yeah. So that's the configuration, right? Obviously, test dot service dot ek is not a valid host name anywhere. Right? Well, so, I wouldn't know that unless you cat your Etsy hosts. Uh, you could be a cheater. I know you, Eugene. <laughs> or grep it if you don't want to cat it. <laughs> All right, proof, proof in the pudding, right there. It's probably capitalized um, in there. So <laughs> let's run some uh, some cloud beats, right? So remember, in this one, we did the input and we just output. What is it input. monitoring? Is it just monitoring like system settings? Uh, file beat just by default monitors everything in the var slash log. All right. So you're gonna see a lot of crap coming. <laughs> Is 
no method. See, guess what? Stuff comes in. And I guess he is it. Are you tailing this? Or are you No, this is just configured out for log stash log. Yeah. I didn't see the command run is all. Oh, oh, I see. So it's being tailed right now. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Oh, it, well, it's well, it's kind of it's kind of tailed, but when you kill it, it just isn't clear if this is the live log or not. It is live. Well, it's live, right? So uh, remember, I showed you the config. Right? Yeah. So input is ED bits, right? But the output is just std out with the Ruby debug. Right? Oh, so that, that's oh, why I, get, that's I why see. Get, so I see. Light lighting, right? I got you. So as it comes in, it's being reflected to standard out. Yep. That's what I was missing. I see. Okay, cool. Well, that's exciting. So now, uh, are those both running on the local machine? But you could run log stash wherever you want now, right? Pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Pretty much. Well, you can. Yeah, I can. Well, <laughs> it has to have internet connection, right? Well, well yes. I can. Well, I can move beats somewhere, right, and collect and get data from that host. Very neat. That's exciting, right? And uh, I, I guess the last thing uh, you showed you wanted to know about the uh, how it can configure the overlay. I'm using my net foundry hosted network. So I'm going to go to App Plans just from, from the top level. I think it's going to be in this is demo. Mm -hmm. So it has the EK test service, right? And um, and the the client one is the the one that was uh, Beats was using. If you remember? I right? see. Right. So if we go close this, go to services. If we look at the EK test service this is the uh, intercept address right 455 and it's hosted by ek hoster which if you remember was used by the log stash yep and we're here we're seeing the net foundry console or cloud zd nowadays yeah uh my only request would that there'd be zdcli commands that accompany this so that people can use zdcli when they want to go and try it out for themselves. Yeah. Well, they that's, can, uh, or they can sign up for free hosted. Or they, or they can indeed. Indeed. Well, that's exciting. Uh, we're at 11 minutes, 11, uh, 43 local time. Uh, do you have anything else? Ken, any questions that came up? This was a great presentation, Eugene. Thanks. I mean, no, I, I know it was it. all just, uh, uh, on demand. So I, like, you know, not a whole lot in the can. It was a good demo. Yeah. Uh, cool. you know, hopefully, you know, people, you know, see it and uh, they can always comment in uh, discourse. Or any of there. our socials. We want to hit us yeah. on Reddit. You hit us on Reddit. Yeah. Discourse, Twitter, Twitter at us. We don't do the Mastodon yet. We still on, we're still on Twitter. Cool. Well, that's exciting. All, All right. right. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, you, you can uh, feel free to dip if you want to dip, or you can hang out and talk to me about service. Yeah. You can talk about service uh, edge router policies. Oh, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hear uh, hear you say you're right, Eugene. Oh, let me tell you, <laughs> Eugene. So let's let me set this up. All right, so let's go back to the old. Uh, it's coming, buddy. It's coming. Let me go back to this. All right. So we had a, a user out on discourse and was talking about, hey, I've got an interesting use case. What happens if I have like a super secret, extra secure site that I only want people to access the zero, even the zero trust stuff if they're in that site? And so, you know, some discussion that went down, some good ideas. Uh, uh, Dariush had a nice idea and I kind of put a little diagram out that kind of says it looks like this, you know, maybe if you, uh, have two identities. You're going to have a public identity and a private identity. And then I said, well, geez, you know, maybe you could do it this other way where you have one single identity where you have a, uh, two routers that don't form a link. And I was talking about this in the uh, daily discussion. 
And Eugene said, well, why don't you just use a service at a service edge router policy? And I said, Eugene, that does not work like that. And Eugene gave me that look. Everybody knows, everybody knows that look. And then uh, I said, well, you know what? I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll test it out. <laughs> and I am going to stick by my guns and say that I have absolutely tested this before. And somehow I must have done it wrong because this time I tested it again and it did work. So basically what I was able to illustrate is that you can have a totally private network with a super extra secure service inside of it and a public router with a link that gets formed and it will still work if you use a service edge router policy. So some more conversations, more conversations. And then I said I did some more testing based on Eugene's amazing input because, as we all know, it's always amazing. And here are the commands that I basically used to go ahead and set up a test environment. So for starters, let's take a look over at the OpenZ to GitHub docs and go to – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exit the Zoom uh, and meeting for all. Uh, come over to the docs, go to the core concepts and security – and maybe I'll just, where is this thing? Uh, it's under policies. I never remember. It's just so much easier to search for it. There it is. Edge router policies, service edge router policies. So uh, on, let me make this bigger too, so it's legible. A uh, few reasons you might want to have pools of edge routers. And one of them is to comply with local laws about accessibility or in this case, to have that super extra secret, you know, secure site and use a service edge router policy. So I actually have a reasonable little lab where I could, let me log in, uh, edge list edge routers. So I have, I have exactly this where I have a public edge router out. In this case, it's an Amazon land. And then I have one of these brand new Innovatos. If you haven't gotten yours, go get one better than a pie. And on that Innovato, I have running a, um, a ZD edge router. And so I, I had this exact situation set up. So I was able to go out, edge list service policies. So I was able to go out and remove the default policy that comes with the quick start, which basically grants every service access to every router. And that comes out of the gate because... Uh, service edge router policies are kind of a more complicated setup. Most people don't really get it. And, and in my experience, I didn't get it. So I was one of those people. Um, and so it's just a lot easier if you allow every service to be bound on every router. But instead, what I could do is I could make a service edge router policy that allowed me only to have a hosted service accessed by my Innovato router, right? So if we look at the uh, ZD edge list service policies, um, actually I want to create, create policies. You can see that when you make a service policy, uh, okay, service policy, where is it? Uh, I'm looking for the roles. Where's the roles? What did I mess up here? Edge create services of policies. That's why. Let's see. There it is. Uh, you can choose the identities that are relevant to the service policy. And this is a service policy. I want the service edge router policy. Come on. There we go. The edge routers that are relevant to the service edge router policy and the services. So I was listening to the wrong thing before, wasn't I? Let's list policies instead. There it is. My hosted service is only accessible by my Innovato router. And so why that's neat is uh, the only way that a this service can be uh, bound is by this particular service itself. So I have a, a C-sharp application, and that C-sharp application was um, hosting this particular service using the intercept approach that Eugene was talking about before. That SDK was recently revamped to, to use the intercept approach. And so I have a C-sharp application that starts up and tries to bind. And when it tries to bind, it reads the routers from the controller that the, the service is allowed to bind to and tries to bind to that particular router. And so since it's all running locally here in my home, I was able to start up 
and run that service locally and have it all get bound correctly. So a Terminator showed up uh, when you would, if you were to run ZD Edge list Terminators, you would have seen the Innovato uh, private hosted one show up here. So that was cool. Then I made two different identities, one of which was my local identity. Go back to the diagram. One was my local identity, which had access to both the internet and my private network like this. And I was able to demonstrate that the service edge router policy correctly prevents onboarding to the overlay and to access that service as well. So um, if I were to move my identity into Amazon, which is what my second identity was for, I was able to show that the Amazon identity wasn't able to uh, attach to this hosted service because the Amazon identity out in the public over here wasn't able to get at the private network, the private router that's hosted in my private network. So because the edge router was in my private network, it was not addressable from the identity that tried to connect to that private edge router. And so I was able to show that the service edge router policy did exactly what it was supposed to do and uh, prevented identities from accessing routers that it weren't they, that the identity was not allowed to access, as well as prevented the binding identity from binding to services that it's not allowed to bind to, all because of the addressability of the underlay. So it sounds like the binding identity's edge router policy had was not a factor here. It could still be, it could still have access to all routers for itself. There just has to be one overlapping and reachable online router between the service router policy and the client's router policy. Uh, visualizing policies, I find always to be a bit of uh, a challenge. So, yeah, so, so the, um, so this server edge router policies, they kind of work for both, right? Um, so it works on both the bind side and the uh, dial side, right? So you could have um, two different policies, one for binding identity saying, when you bind, when this identity binds this service, it has to be bound, it has to create terminated through this edge router, like a private one, right? And you also can create a service edge router policy that uh, actually, it's not for identity, right? It's per service. Yeah, it kind of, kind of that 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 policy will actually work on both both sides, right? So if you have a limited pool, you have to create a pool of edge routers specific for a service. That's that's how you would do it through the edge router policy. And this is um, is important in some cases where. Um, as, as Clint mentioned before, yeah, you have local laws where your data cannot go through uh, from outside the country, for example, right? In, in Europe, there's a lot of laws that are not that, right? So if you live in France and your services in France, you just create a edge router in France, create edge router policy that says all the connections that go to the service from inside France can only be go over you know, French connections. Uh, we also had another customer where um, they only wanted to. It was an IoT solution on a on a mobile, on a like a truck or car, right? And they wanted to have an update service that is only accessible from within uh, within like a dealership or within a service or maintenance facility, right? So that was a solution that presented to them saying. You basically deploy HR in your maintenance facility, and then your service only available if your um, your truck can connect to that HR within the maintenance facility. It's only available through like Wi-Fi, local Wi-Fi, or maybe wired internet. But when it's on the road, uh, because it's not really really sitting outside of the mobile net on the mobile network, then your truck cannot get updated. Over the over the five G or four G or three G, right? 
because they, that's not right. That's what that's that's exact thing they wanted to prevent. Yep. All right. Well, we're at the top of the hour. I think it's a good time to stop. I think that was a yet another fantastic ZDTV. Thank you, Eugene, for showing up and uh, being so nimble and being able to display that. And talk to it. So thanks thanks for having me. Yeah, it's always great. Ken, always a pleasure. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. I don't know what we're going to do next week yet, but uh, it might be uh, home automation. It might be something else. We've got a few. We've actually got a few um, external ZDTV people, hopefully, going to show up soon. We can do, so. like, home automation with the holiday theme. With the holiday theme? Nice. <laughs> All right, fellas. Take care.